Okay, and we are live, just waiting for people to join. Let me just close my emails down so they don't ping. Be awkward if Hi, you're everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We'll just give everyone a minute or so to join and then we will start. But let me introduce those of you that are here already to the legend that is at Bethany England. Lioness and captain of Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, she is here to talk about being a dog owner and thinking back to when she got her dogs as puppies and uh, share some insights and stories about what she wished she knew before she got one. Um, so we've got a few people on already, so I think we will start. So, uh, Bethany, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this. No uh, I know you're... Uh, busy with a uh, training and the season has just kicked off. Um, the first question I'd love to ask you, oh, and sorry, before I do, please do everyone uh, comment with any questions that you would like to ask and we will try and put those to Bethany at the end. Um, so yeah, first up, thinking back to when you got Buddy, your first dog, um, how did you prepare for bringing him home? And was there anything that you hadn't prepared for that you did with when you got your second dog? Yeah, so for me, um, when I first got Buddy, um, I felt like I'd tried my best to do my due diligence as best as I could, um, whether that was when I went and met the breeder before he was even born, um, making sure that everything was vetted so he wasn't coming from what you call a puppy farm. Um, and when I say I was so excited to get Buddy, it was kind of like you bringing a child into the world. You went, I went out and bought everything possible, must have spent a fortune on toys, food, leads, a personalised collar, you name it, I bought it, literally. I couldn't wait to to bring him back. And I think the biggest thing for me, what I found that helped was um, starting him off straight away from the first night in his crate. So crate training him. And to this day, he still uses his crate. We don't use it in terms of him needing to go in it for any reason. It's just there mainly as a safety net if he sometimes needs a bit of a time out for himself or away from our other dog um, and likewise our other dog she also does the same so I would say the biggest thing for me was making sure that he knew where he slept at night time and he was able to be safe in there and not see it as a punishment um, so I'm really glad that I stuck with that crate training and luckily for me he was a bit of a catfish he was a dream in the crate had no issues with him he just slept there comfortably every night and he was very good at alerting me when he needed to go out for the toilet during the night. He would always tap on the cage door, which also gave me an indication of when he was going to go. So I think that made the process much easier. Um, but then in terms of being prepared for when we got the second dog, um, so we have two dogs, uh, Buddy and Dillis. They are the same breed. They're uncle and niece. And um, I think at first we expected Dillis to be the exact same as Buddy, very easy going, very laid back dog easy to train although she is quite good at, in her training um she was nothing like him when we brought her home she didn't like the crate would scream the house down would have us up at all hours of the night uh toilet training took a lot more work than buddy he kind of naturally picked that up really quickly so we tend to come home to a lot more accidents or we're sorting out more accidents in the house with the second one um, but I think, again, knowing we did our due diligence and sticking at it with Buddy, we stuck with the same process and eventually she got there, whereby um, they obviously are both really great in the cray and thankfully now they're much older, so their toilet training is much better as well. Um, so, yeah, they would be the biggest things that I would say helped us in terms of bringing our dog into our family was making sure that they knew that they had a safe space to sleep in um, and that it wasn't seen as a punishment whenever they were put in the crate. And obviously they, they're the same uh, breed and from the, the same breeder and related, but um, what did you do in terms of introducing introducing them? Because obviously they hadn't met, met before, you got them at different times. So how did you settle them in and get them to interact and be best friends? Yeah, so obviously you can be quite conscious when bringing in a new dog into your home. Um, some dogs might see it as a territorial thing and you, you can worry that they're going to get possessive over, I guess, their home. Um, but to be fair, again, Buddy is personality. He's such a laid back, chilled dog that we didn't tend to have many worries with him. So we made sure that we had the hallway cleared so that when usually we would 
if we meet other dogs or we bring them to the house, they meet in the garden in an open space or down the street so that they walk to the house. Uh, but with obviously Dillis just being a puppy, we brought her into the house, into the hallway, as, as I said, kept it clear and made sure that it was um, he was there waiting for us so that he could, when we brought her in in our hands, bless obviously they're really cute, you can just carry them in. And um, he had a good little sniff and we put her down. And to be fair, we weren't sure if she was going to be scared of him, how she would react. So we, there were three of us there at the time to make sure we were all on hand if anything was to go wrong. Um, so I would say uh, definitely making sure that there's people there that can help a situation if needed. Um, but yeah, we put her down and straight away from the minute go, she was the boss. I think he kind of knew that she was about to come into his life and make his life a terror, but also become his best friend and companion. And yeah, she uh, she very much took to him. As I say, she she went over to him. She would sniff him. She would have a little bark at him, kind of get used to him and start biting him straight away. And as we all know, we puppy teeth, it's not always the nicest little bites that you get either. So yeah, it was just kind of like making sure that we were there to make sure that nothing went wrong. Or if it did, we were there to be prepared for that. Um, and luckily, Dillis being Dillis and her personality, she just went straight in for it and kind of forced Buddy to love her, really. Oh, lovely. Always good to hear that. And uh, what have you done um, in terms of socialising them when they were puppies? Because obviously there's a small window that's really important for them to to learn uh, everything really that's going to impact what they become as an adult dog. Yeah. So for me, I, I live quite a busy, energetic lifestyle uh, being a footballer. So when Buddy was a puppy at first, obviously I would have to go to training. So for me, I was having to learn to be able to leave him. For Thankfully, I didn't live too far away from the training ground. So it made my life easier being able to go back and feed him, having to do his three feeds a day. Um, so he was getting used to being separated from me at times, only for short periods, which made him realise that I would always come home. Um, but in terms of socialising with other people, dogs and sounds, um, it first started off with the breeder. They were very good in when we picked Buddy up and the same with Dillis. We always got given a checklist, um, which shows whether they'd been tested around, say, a hoover, if they get scared of things like that. They'd been in the boot of the car when they've gone to their vet's appointments for their vaccinations. Um, whether that's obviously just being around other dogs that aren't uh, that are within their litter and that they've not had to be separated due to any other reasons or issues with the mother. Um, and then for myself, when I actually brought him home, luckily I had friends on the team that also had other dogs, which made it easier in settling him to being sociable, being able to take him out again in open spaces. A lot of my friend's dogs that we met for the first time were in an open field where he can get used to the grass first, have a sniff around before engaging in them. We, we've got a, got a, oh, we've got a friend here as well right now. This is Billis. Oh, uh, who wants some attention. She's a, she's a, I'm talking about a brother. That's what it is. She's getting jealous. Um, I'm, I'm the special girl. <laughs> she's definitely, a, she's, she's the attention one. Um, but. Yeah, so it was kind of easy for me of a process to be able to introduce him to other dogs. And we also um, looked, I have had him at places such as doggy daycare, where I know my friends had taken their dogs. So I trusted that they were a, a safe space for them to be able to go and play with other dogs and also get used to playing with other dogs away from me um, and not be too attached to me all the time. Um, so I think it was just a process. I'd say I don't know. I didn't know everything at the time. It was kind of a learning curve. Um, but again, because I was at the training ground, there was times where I was able to take Buddy in with me. And he, so many people naturally would fuss him. I'm quite biased in that he's a very handsome boy. Uh, so he got all the attention. And the girls that were in my team at the time were very big dog people. So it, it made it easier on who wanted to be on puppy duty. Um, as well as staff members helping out him then. So I think I was very lucky in the sense that I had a great support system, um, especially with my partner. Um, if I was away playing football and games, they were able to be there and do their walks. And we knew the scheduling and how strict we were with, right, they get fed at this time, his walks are usually at this time, et cetera. So I think that was a key thing and fundamental thing for me when he was a puppy, as well as for Dillis was having a support network and places that you knew that were safe in which you could take them to interact. 
Yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? Otherwise, it can, you know, that the research from Burns and Admiral found that some people said they didn't realise how much their dog would impact their social life. So it's really important to have them have that trust in other people. So you can leave them with someone else and they're not so dependent on you. Yeah, 100%, because sometimes emergencies can happen or things come up and other people may need to take your dog and you kind of not necessarily take them, but look after them, sorry. And it's kind of like you want to be able to trust that those people have the same interests and love and care for your pet just as much as they would if it was a child, because for me, they are my children. So I'm very particular about who I let around my dogs or who I leave my dogs with, because I want to know that they're in the safest hands possible, really. And as you said, it does impact your social life. And I'm lucky that I, but we take ours to the pub all the time. We love doing pub quizzes. And luckily, the area in which I'm in allows dogs to be there. So we're not always having to leave them. And where we can, uh, in the little time that I do get off, I like to take them out with me. Oh, lovely. And uh, I'd like to ask you about sort of thinking back about the, the unexpected. So is there anything that... Um, turned out to be a hazard for your your dogs when they were puppies or now that you didn't expect would be a hazardous thing in your home? Yeah, so for me, the weirdest one I found, which um, you obviously don't want to leave hazards around, and to my best knowledge, I thought I'd puppy-proofed my flat or made everything a-okay and safe enough that they wouldn't come to any harm. And lo and behold, it turns out Buddy liked to go into the wash basket and to eat socks which it sounds funny, which it can be funny. And um, there's definitely been times where he's eaten a whole sock and we've seen it come out whole at the other end as well. Um, and there's quite a worry in that because you don't want obviously any of the string to come off and it wrap around his intestines and stuff. Um, don't ask me why I love socks so much. He, he just does. But um, yeah, that seemed to be something that we had to be very conscious of within the house of making sure that the basket was either tall enough that he couldn't get to, had a lid on that could shut or keep it in a place where he just simply couldn't get to them. Because the last thing I'd want is him to come up, us to come home and him have chewed this sock and either one choked, like say two, wrapped around his intestine or any danger could have happened with it really. I mean, he had an abundance of toys that clearly just weren't good enough for him that he chose that the sock was better. But mm. I think it's just small things like that I weren't fully aware of, of the amount of things that they can eat like even if it's when you first start walking your puppy for some reason he would always pick up wet wipes as well off the floor and he absolutely loved them and again there it's not tissue where it dissolves they they stay firmly together as a tissue yeah. and it would it can get lodged in his throat so there's lots of things that he just seemed to want to pick up as a baby um but thankfully we've again there's there's days where we we do miss happened I've come home and there's been the odd sock on the bed but fully thankfully not nothing chewed or swallowed but you do still have to keep your due diligence with them um and another one for me with regards to our girl dog Dillis um I had a bit of an instance where I it was my first off off lead training day with her trying to make Buddy was already off lead because he's he'd already been trained and we're trying to teach her her recall and I stupidly did it in a in the woodlands where I used to usually walk buddy but not being prepared for the fact that because it was quite narrow um I didn't notice that a horse had come around the corner so quickly and it had been the first time that Dillis had seen a horse buddy had seen them plenty of times and he's never reacted to them so at first I didn't obviously see it being an issue because I know buddy's never reacted so everything Dillis will be the same however she seen the horse and absolutely freaked out and set off She's only like 12, 13 weeks old, bless her, and starts running and barking towards this horse. And I mean, there's no fear in this girl, which I must give her credit for. But for myself, go charging at a horse of uh, anyone knows, obviously, a horse can do a lot of damage to a person, mm -hmm. let alone a tiny puppy. And um, so as she set off barking at the horse, the horse has naturally then started to kick out its legs. And there's a rider on the horse. So not only am I scared for my dog, myself, the rider on the horse as well as the horse's well-being um and then buddy's naturally heard the commotion and come over to protect what he he knows now is his little sister so it was a very scary and stressful situation for me that i had to learn very quickly to whilst i'm training it i wanted to avoid small spaces where like say like the likes of horses can come out of nowhere that you're not prepared for and i 
to this day, I still have a bit of, I would say, like a traumatic experience when I see a horse, although I know now um, they're very well trained. They'll sit. I always make sure they come to me when I see a horse, sit and wait with me, and they just watch the horse go by, go past us, sorry, and there's no issue at all. But I still get flashbacks to that day of panicking that she was going to potentially get severely hurt or someone was going to get injured because I wasn't fully aware of my surroundings. And I'm just thankful that it didn't end worse. Sorry, they're, my dogs are now fighting in the background. If you can hear some of the, the joys as well, they just fight whenever you're on important calls. Yeah. Um, uh, usually the case, or barking. Um, but yeah, I would say that was probably a big lesson that I learned was to make sure that in the early stages, yes, I agree in exposing them to as many things as possible, but doing it probably in a more safer controlled environment where I wasn't in control in that situation. And again, luckily for me, it didn't turn out to be such a bad thing. Yeah. And I think that what you were saying there about what you do now when you see dogs is important because obviously you still feel the trauma of that. And it's really easy for your anxiety to pass on to your dogs, isn't it? That could actually cause the same situation. So yeah. it's saying that sort of you're, you're just preparing that it's going to happen and therefore they're not then reacting. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the thing. Dogs are not stupid. They're very clever. They pick up on the senses that you give out as well as what's around them. And if they can sense fear, naturally, they will react according to your fear. And it's the same as usually if you're, um, we had this discussion the other day, if you're someone with a dog on a lead and you're naturally pulling the lead and that tension on the lead can naturally insinuate that there's fear coming towards the owner and then the dog's likely to be more reactive because they're sensing danger and um, so I think it's just about learning your dog learning your dog's personalities learning the cues and the triggers that you could be giving your dog and just making sure that in most instances as possible that you're, you're as calm and collected as you can be and like I said for me in that moment with the horse I wasn't calm I was shaking like crazy and it was a very frantic situation um, but it's something that I've definitely learned from and um, thankfully I've never been in that situation since by again doing my due diligence and being more aware of my surroundings and what's going on yeah and a, a big lesson that just because one dog is not not reactive to horses or something else doesn't mean the the other yeah. one is going to be the same exactly yeah and then uh, what would be your top tips for people in terms of settling in a new puppy whether it's a first time puppy or a se second second one joining the family um I would say top tips if you're bringing in a second dog I would definitely say making sure again it's in a safe controlled space where um I would say there's usually more than one person there so if anything does happen you have helped to alleviate any issues um but bringing bringing in a puppy into your environment again like I say I've learned from my mistakes don't leave any uh, hazardous items of clothing out there that could potentially cause any dangers. Um, I would definitely advocate for um, when they're going through their teething stage, um, a trick I used was putting carrots in a freezer so that when mm -hmm. uh, my buddy also had a fantastic habit of chewing my coffee table, which was wooden. Um, so for me, it was kind of a way of stopping him from chewing that and because it was just something that was on his gums that he clearly enjoyed the feel of so it's finding new tricks and ways to entertain them without them destroying your furniture mm -hmm. so yeah as I said I would freeze um, carrots so not only would it be quite hard for him but it would also be cold and soothing on his gums um, you can get lots of different uh, toys and arranges of things that you can put in freezers and things with treats in that are mm -hmm. good for their gums but that was definitely probably one of the biggest things that helped when he was young was that he, while still getting used to his environment and that he wasn't allowed to destroy things in my environment, it was also helping him not being as much pain with his teeth as well. Yeah, that's a really good tip. My sister's dog chewed through a kitchen cupboard, so <laughs> she should have, uh, mm -hmm. that. yeah. So it's, yeah, definitely the teething's a big thing if you don't want them to destroy your furniture. Um, we've got yeah. a couple of questions here. Um, Lewis has asked, uh, how do you, how did you make sure that they got on straight away? Which I think you've talked about the, how you introduced them, but did you, uh, do anything like play games with them or anything to get them to sort of interact or did you just kind of leave them to it, but supervised? 
Um, at first, it was definitely more. I'm not. I'm in control of the situation of if something happens. However, it was more like it's Buddy's choice to suss out Dillis and her choice to suss out him. I think it's important that they know you're there um, to feel protected if anything is to happen. But at, initially, we just let them kind of have a good sniff and yeah as you say just suss each other out but then as um the evening evening went on um we obviously would naturally we brought a lot more toys because we got a new dog and in terms of sharing it was kind of like look buddy i'm giving one of your toys to Dillis to show that it's not yours so it's to not be territorial over possessions that we have in the house so it's like these aren't just your toys they're now like yours as, a, as, as two dogs as toys that anyone can play with them um, and I think it's important to learn with two dogs that they don't become too possessive over what's theirs and what's not because then you get such a big dominance we do have a little bit of that because Dillis is the boss and she does like to think that she can take her toy and his toy however when we take it off her and give it to him she'll nine times out of ten leave him but on the initial thing it can be something that's really difficult and I wouldn't even say I'm an expert in it just yet but it's still there's no perfect way to bring up your dog like say every dog's got its own personality and character it's just learning what makes your dog tick and Dillis definitely likes to test the boundaries on how much she can take from Buddy and mm -hmm. thankfully Buddy's a very calm relaxed dog that couldn't care less um, but also it's that if she's in an environment where we take her to our friend's house where there's other toys she's not dominating them for their possessions um, so I would say that would be the biggest one is making sure that they're inclusive with their toys. They're not necessarily sacred about their own space, although it's healthy for them to have their own space, but it's that it's both their home now, not just I was here first, you live by my rules type thing. Although their dogs, again, dominance can be quite a, a tough thing to, to try and stamp out. Yeah, one always wants to be the alpha. Uh, we've yeah. got one more question here. If anyone else has got any questions, please do just add them in the comments and we can ask them. Otherwise, this will be the last one and we'll wrap up. But uh, Jenny would like to know, how did you decide what to feed them? So for us, we've gone through two different um, feeding processes. Firstly, with Buddy. So when I got him from the breeder, he was on dry food. Uh, just dry food um, and we followed the process which was advised was by the breeder how much he needs feeding when his feeding goes up what and at what point his feeding changes from three times a day to two meals per day um, and Buddy seemed to get a little bit bored of his food um, and to be fair I think I'd be a bit bored if I was just eating biscuits all day every day um, so we looked into adding different meats to his food, um, dog meat, um, which was um, able to probably give it a bit more flavour and not be as dry for him. And we found that he uh, ate his food much better. Um, and what I like about the fact that with the meat, so we currently feed ours on burned dog food um, and they love it. And there's so many different types of uh, dog meats that you can get within it, whether it's chicken, so many flavours, chicken, beef, salmon, fish, all different types of fishes. Um, and what they come in is they've got like little rice parts in. So it's not just they're eating, say, chicken and biscuits. There's different types of nutrients and goodness in them and vitamins that they need. But then when we got Dillis, she was um, bred on raw. Even though it was from the same breeder, they changed within two years of us getting body from feeding them on dry food to raw food which that, if you've never had, is an experience because some of it can smell a lot, especially the tripe, yeah. um, and especially when it comes out the other end as well, which most people aren't prepared for. Um, I can't say it's the most pleasant. Um, so we initially agreed to keep her on that for a, a certain period whilst that's all what we knew, whether being a puppy, and we didn't want to suddenly change her diet and upset her stomach. And then gradually we, because we'd had no issues with Buddy, trying the food we then decided to try Dillis with Burns as well we gradually weaned her off the um, raw food we didn't do it all in one hit because again we didn't want to unsettle her stomach and we needed to know in case there was any intolerances if she reacted badly to it um, so we just do it stage by stage um, and then in the end went full on to Burns so that's again a mixture of dry and wet dog food um, and they've been on that ever since really so 
Yeah, it and it must be hard to feed two different dogs different foods as well, because I guess they get a bit jealous of what the the other one's got. So it's much easier, isn't it, to sort of create that routine and have them on the yeah. same same thing. I yeah, it's exactly that. And I think one thing you don't want is one dog to, especially knowing that Dillis can be a little bit bossy due to her personality. I wouldn't want her eating her food and then going over and being like, oh, what have you got? I'm going to eat yours. Because I know for a fact Buddy would leave it and let her take it. And then you don't want one getting overfed and one being underfed. Um, and also at that time, with her being such a smaller puppy compared to him, she needed much less food. So it's just making sure you got the balance right in how much each dog needed. Um, I know that when she was a puppy and she would get three meals a day, Buddy would be looking at us like, well, why is she getting another meal and I'm not? So it was kind of like you had to give him a little treat as in like, oh, there's your little yeah. little prize as well. Um, <laughs> but thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. Right. Thank you so much for your time, Bethany. I don't think we've got any more questions, but thank you everyone for joining. We've still got more classes to come. Uh, Bethany will be joining us for another class. So if you've just joined at the end and missed the rest, you can join us again um, on Monday, the 23rd of October. Um, but we've got coming up this Friday, Ask the Vet with uh, TikTok star Bed the Vet. We've got Finding a Puppy with uh, Eileen, who is a breeder. Um, and then we have also got behavior and training um, on the 25th of October. Um, that is with Orla McCarthy. Um, and then we have got a new class that we'll be adding details of very soon. But that is around rescue dogs. And that's around National Adopt-A-Dog Day. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much again, Bethany, for your time. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me and I hope it was insightful for people and the life of Golden Retrievers. <laughs> <laughs>